Welcome back, legends, champions, new subscribers, old subscribers. I hope you're all fantastic. It's time for another installment of Friday Q&A number 136, which means we're kind of close to 150 Q&As. I think the countdown's begun right there. Uh, if you have questions you would like me to answer in next week's Q&A, please let me know in the comments. If you want to support the channel, links in the video description. There was a lot of questions this week, which made me very, very happy. Thank you all so much for the questions. I will try to answer as many as I can, starting with this question. Uh, what do I think about Birds of Tokyo? They for the uninitiated, uh, a, a kind of like pop rock band from Perth. They have probably been the most successful Australian band in that genre over, say, the last decade, uh, featuring uh, Ian Kenny, who's also the lead singer for Carnival. So if you're a Carnival fan and you like your kind of uh, poppier, straight ahead rock stuff, you're probably going to like that because you probably like Kenny's voice. But uh, their drummer, Adam, is actually our, he, well, he runs the distribution company. We release all our music through Firestarter Distribution. So yeah, they're nice people and I kind of wish them all the success. And I think they're playing at the grand final this year in Perth, which is a pretty big deal if you're an AFL fan. I really liked their first album when it came out. And from memory, there used to be a forum back before you had Facebook just kind of taking over everything. There was a local forum called perthbands.com and I'm fairly sure they kind of met all the members there. So uh, yeah, they're very much a homegrown success story. Uh, wish them all the best. Uh, can I feature a guitar from my collection per week? Let's do that. That will <laughs> probably get us through uh, like half a year or something like that. I'll noodle around with something at the end of this video. I won't tell you what it is just yet, but I will do it when I do it. Uh, the FM9 versus the Axe FX3. Can I do a video with just the raw amp tones demonstrating that they sound the same? I could, but they do sound the same. There's a lot of videos out there with the FM3 and the Axe FX3 showing that they sound the same. And I think I would probably rather devote my time and energy to showing people how to use stuff rather than uh, doing like the comparison clip thing. I know I've done a lot of comparison clip stuff in the past, but it's not something I'm super excited about at the moment because I just have so much other stuff going on at the moment, especially with the channel and pieces of gear. I want to get demoed and out there. So uh, hopefully some other kind person will do that. If you've got a bunch of old 80s, like OG shredder guitars, should you get rid of them and maybe trade up for something more modern? This was like a car and, you know, you had like some kind of <laughs> mid-level car from the 80s that you were still driving around and it was costing you a whole bunch of money in fuel and you were like, should I get a Tesla? That would be a bit of a different question, but guitars don't work like that. And I, I feel like I've said this before, there's multiple reasons to own guitars. Uh, there's the functional reason that, you know, you want a guitar to play. There is the sentimental reason that it's a guitar that you've played for a long time. And there's a bunch of other reasons out there. So uh, yeah, I am not going to uh, give any definitive advice either way. Maybe just think about what you want kind of tone wise and playability wise out of the guitars. And if your current guitars aren't doing that and you can find something that is going to deliver that, then that's a good reason. If it's just a, oh, I'm kind of bored of this guitar, I want a different one, then uh, you're probably not gonna find long-term happiness with anything like that. Uh, can I do a video on Steve Morse and the Dixie Dregs? Maybe some five minute lick stuff, uh, maybe a bit of too many notes from his uh, amazing solo album, High Tension Wires. Uh, Modoc is another great one as well. Uh, yeah, Steve is, you know, he was called the guitarist's guitarist and I still kind of feel like he has that status, especially with the like deification of John Petrucci recently, who definitely deserves it. John's amazing. I love Dream Theater. I love John. But uh, I feel like really early in his career, a lot of people just like, he's just taken Steve Morse chops and uh, playing it through a Mark series and, you know, with like a Metallica tone or something. So yeah, I feel like uh, Steve should be a much bigger part of the conversation. And he's played way more gigs with Deep Purple than Richie ever did. So I guess he, he really is the Deep Purple guitarist now, which is kind of a weird thing. I've seen him live with Deep, Deep Purple and it was so good. His guitar sound was amazing. I love Steve Morse. I go and check out some Steve Morse this weekend. All right, 
Am I going to gig with the FM9 over the Axe FX3 because of portability? Yes. I am a minimalist when it comes to taking stuff to gigs. Most of the gigs I do, I take one guitar and I've been taking the FM3 for a long time. The last handful of gigs I've done, uh, I've been taking the FM9 in like a case. So I have my guitar bag and the FM9. I've actually been taking my FM3 in my guitar bag as well so that I've got a proper backup rig, which is kind of exciting. But yeah, I really try to take as little stuff as possible. So if I can take the FM9 rather than a three rack unit thing with a foot controller, then uh, that's just less gear. And that's the way I'm thinking about that with that. And especially a lot of the gigs we're doing where the load-ins are terrible. I know a lot of you out there feel me on that one. Uh, will I do a video with the new Boss 200 series pedals like the SY200 and the IR200? Yes, I mean, I have them both here. Uh, shout out to Boss Australia for loaning these to me. I'm just finishing up a track, like a synthwave style thing with this that I've been working on today. That'll pro probably be out later next week. And the IR200, the amp modeler will be up tomorrow. That one's done and scheduled. And I think a lot of people are really gonna enjoy that fun little box. Can I do some videos showcasing my workflow when I am recording music at home? So doing some demo songs. I've done some videos like this in the past. If you just kind of trawl back through the videos, I know there's a lot of videos because I basically do a video every single day. There's also a few little mix breakdowns on my Patreon. If you want to support the Patreon channel, that is linked in the video description. I will try and do some more of those for all the patrons as well. An Explorer versus a Les Paul. If you already got a Les Paul, do you need an Explorer? The obvious answer is yes. But uh, even though they are like, twin humbucker set neck Gibson guitars. I think the big thing with an Explorer style shape is uh, just where the bridge and the neck sit in relation to your body. Like I feel like a Les Paul, you know, kind of feels like the, what should we call it? Like it's almost like the center of mass or something like that is just in a different place than it is on an Explorer. So. Uh, if you're a tall person like me, I love playing uh, that Hamer standard, the Explorer shape live, just because when I'm standing up and the guitar hangs on my shoulder, I feel like rather than my hands being here, they're kind of over here, which is a much more comfortable position uh, for my hands and for my shoulders as well. And they're a lightning bolt shape. So uh, yeah, and they're a big old hunk of wood, which I really, really like. So I, I think one of the best uh, kind of modern Gibsons I've played recently is actually just the like standard factory Explorer. They're really, really good guitars. And obviously the Hamer stuff is great as well. The ESP variations are kind of hard to go wrong with that shape, in my opinion, especially if you're like a Les Paul. Uh, could I do a breakdown of a Keith Merrow style tone from his latest stuff? I would probably guess if you were just plugging your guitar into an amp and a cab or into a modeler or a plug-in and you're not getting that sound, it's probably because a lot of that stuff is, uh, I'm gonna guess double or quad tracked. I haven't watched a lot of Keith's channel recently. Uh, I wanna say maybe five years ago, uh, he was one of the first YouTube demo guys I was really aware of and you know, just him demoing all the different pickups and amps was uh, was pretty cool. So maybe, maybe I'll deep dive on a bit of Keith. Uh, I saw that clip where I think it was, is it, was it Jeff Loomis guesting on his latest stuff or something, which was uh, mind altering as you can imagine. Uh, will I try the Boss GT1000? Uh, I have tried the Boss GT1000 and the SY1000, and I've got quite a few videos with them for anybody who's interested in checking that out. I think the amp modeling is really good. Uh, my main criticism of it is that uh, the whole like, boss approach to just here's a thing and we might put out a few bug fixes uh, is I don't know it just kind of feels like out of step with the way everybody else does their thing like fractal and line six where you get a constant set of updates and usability improvements and like you know you buy the thing but it's kind of like getting a subscription to new stuff that like semi agile model so I would love if they added some updates to the GT especially the editor because I think it's very very capable it just feels like their kind of attitude is hey we put a thing out and the thing works go and use the thing and Really, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. We're uh, maybe just a little bit spoiled with some of the other units out there. But yeah, it's really good for the price. I think it's pretty hard to beat. Uh, I obviously enjoy the fractal approach to everything. That's why I use like all of their products live, but it doesn't mean that I think any of the other things are 
like bad in any way. So yeah, check those out. Uh, speaking of gear, have I tried a TCG system? No, I very nearly bought one about 12 months ago, uh, but I ended up, was it 12? Maybe it was like more like two years ago. I don't know, man, this this whole uh, <laughs> COVID climate, it gives you foggy brain. I can't remember when stuff was and wasn't, but I bought a GeForce instead because the GeForce was cheaper, but I know a lot of people out there who uh, before stuff like the Axe FX was out were using a G system. I think Michael Romeo might still use one and it's good enough for Michael Romeo. It's probably good enough for the rest of us. What's my favorite overdrive pedal? A few come to mind, probably uh, the top three, the Boss SD-1, the first pedal I ever bought, still a legendary unit, are the Anarchy Audio Workhorse, which is a clon style drive. I love that thing. It stayed on my board the longest when I was using a pedal board and amps, and uh, probably the Origin FX Revival Drive Hot Rod, which I recently reviewed. That is a phenomenal sounding drive uh, for kind of more, I use the Workhorse and the SD1 more as like boosts, but for like pure drives into clean amps or power amps, I think the Revival Drive is my favorite. Three hot tips. Right there, Dave Murray from Iron Maiden. Yeah, I rate Dave big time. I love his tone. I love his phrasing. I love the way he uses like hammer-ons and slides and legato playing and him and Adrian, the way they play off one another on all the uh, kind of classic era Maiden stuff is just awesome. I feel like Dave is, you know, he's like, uh, he's like the velvet glove and then Adrian is like the iron fist inside the velvet glove there with the way they attack their leads and their playing. So yeah, Maiden, what a band, what a band. Uh, do I like Down? I do like Down. Uh, one of the coolest things I think I've ever seen was one of my buddy's bands played at the last Soundwave Festival here in Perth and uh, Down played and Phil was just roaming around backstage uh, just being really, really, really cool. Got to meet Phil, gave me a big hug. I nearly like broke all my ribs uh, doing that, but <laughs> he uh, he got a whole bunch of different people up uh, to do Bury Me in Smoke. And I forget, I feel like there were some of the Macedon guys and a few other guys, but yeah, they were fantastic live. And I think their live sound actually has been captured very well on their recordings. Uh, with the camera stuff, this one pops up quite a bit. Uh, I think a lot of people have taken my recommendation with the Canon EOS M50, which is a camera I use for all these videos. Uh, I can tell you the settings I'm using, which I have the shutter speed at 180th, I have the f-stop at 3.5, and I have the ISO at 1600 on manual film mode, but if you're not getting the same results, it's lighting. Uh, go and spend money on lights before you spend money on any other camera upgrades like lenses or anything like that. I have some soft boxes that I got from Amazon and they add an immense amount of light to this room and they make it really, really easy to get, you know, decent looking footage uh, for a, I would say a relatively inexpensive camera. Just get some good lighting. That's all you need to do. You could get a ring light from Amazon for not much money, put the camera in that, and then your source is always lit. That's another way to do it. Uh, was it a bad idea to buy an AX8 a year ago? No, the AX8's amazing. Go and use it and make some music with it. It's still an excellent form factor. I still gigged mine when I had an Axe FX3 before the FM3 came out. Uh, the firmware development was uh, pretty mature on it. There's a few things which I think have definitely been improved on with stuff like the FM9, namely the layouts. The modeling's been updated. There's some new effect types, but if you know what you're doing with the AX8, you can get world-class tones with it. Don't fret. Uh, like anything, you can get world-class tones with like an old pod. So many albums were recorded with those. I feel like anything past that is just kind of gravy on the top. Speaking about revisiting old gear, uh, the pod is something that I revisited recently and I've been doing the whole uh, just kind of rack mount gear thing over the last, what, two years now. So yeah, I've kind of made it my motto to revisit as many things that I own as possible. One that really stuck out to me though was when I first tried a Marshall DSL. I liked it, but I ended up going down like the rack route. So I had a JMP1 and a G major and a BBE. And then I had this gig where it was just more appropriate to use a head. And I was like, oh, I'll get the DSL out and you know, I'll actually put some effort into understanding how it worked. And then it became one of my favorite amps ever. And I kind of built my early sound with Ragdoll around that. If you go and listen to our first two EPs, that's very DSL driven stuff. Oh, 
We're almost through all of these questions. This is great. Uh, the band Nagura Bungit. Yes, there is a blast from the past. I actually looked them up just before I did this and I noticed that they had a new song out. Uh, so I gave that a blast and like really, I don't know how you would describe the style of music that they play, but to me, they're like a good band. If you say to somebody like, yeah, I like metal, but you know, there's other styles of metal than just things that sound like Slayer in 1984 or Judas Priest. They're a great example. Uh, the way they can meld kind of like symphonic black metal and uh, just like all that stuff. It's just really, really cool. And the latest song, I forget the name, it was like Brad or something. Uh, the production value is great on it. And it's cool to see some music coming out of Romania. It just kind of goes to prove that it doesn't really matter where you were born. Uh, there is there is this language called music that you can learn to speak and you can use it to communicate with other humans around the world. And that's pretty amazing stuff. Victory Amps. Yes, I've tried the Kraken. Uh, my buddy Nick, who has lent me his JCM800 and his Plexi before on the channel. Thank you, Nick, if you're watching this. You're a legend. Uh, I think he owned a Kraken for a while and that sounded really cool. I liked the like 5150 inspired channel on it. And for such a kind of small amp, their cabinets sound really good as well. So yeah, absolutely awesome amps. I think they were same guy who did Cornford amps for a while or something like that. I might have my uh, wires crossed with that one. If so, let me know in the comments. And before we do Guitar of the Week, aren't we meant to be in lockdown? What am I doing playing shows? And isn't Australia basically just North Korea at the moment? Uh, you know, I really strive to not delve into the political content right here, but I will just say clearly not in Western Australia. Australia is a very, very big country. It is a federation of states and every state has a different approach to COVID-19 management. And Western Australia's has mostly meant that we have zero COVID in the community. You can visit the Western Australian government or any of the Australian government websites and actually see what the restrictions are rather than worrying about, uh, you know, I saw like Australia kind of went viral in the United States media and I saw some stuff from uh, both sides of the political spectrum and I feel like both sides of them uh, kind of got it wrong, including some writers I really respect from kind of both sides of the spectrum there. So yeah, it's like Australia is not America. Just remember that. I understand that a lot of people who watch my channel are from the United States. I love the United States. You know, I have family in the United States. I love playing there. I love the people. Before I went to the States, I would read so many bad things about the USA. And when I finally went there, it was kind of like nothing like the depiction that you saw on the nightly news here. And I was kind of blown away by just how generous people uh, that I met there were. And, you know, American civic and political culture is different to Australian civic and political culture. And I feel like with the way uh, kind of news media especially has moved because of, you know, disruption with social media, it's so easy to just hear what you want to hear with any of that stuff. So, uh, yeah, Western Australia, we're doing OK at the moment. I'm sure there's a bunch of people who would like really, really vehemently disagree with me. But that's not my role to talk about this. You know, look out for my other channel, which is Political Hot Takes. You know, we have a show tonight at Convenience. If you're in Perth, Western Australia, we have a residency every Tuesday night. I feel like the luckiest person in the world at the moment. But like I said, all of these resources are available. You can go and make up your mind for yourself. It's time for Guitar of the Week. Guitar of the Week is this Schroeder Marksman all the way from Hamburg, Germany. It's purple, it has 27 frets. It's got a chunky late 50s Les Paul style neck with a Gibson scale. And it's the only guitar I have with a properly set up Floyd Rose style bridge on it. I'll play you all out with this. If you have any specific questions you would like me to answer in next week's video, please put them in the comment section below. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. Stay safe, be good to one another. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.